Hello, and welcome to Portfolio Matters, week 119. And it has been an eventful week in the markets, and not necessarily in a good way. But before we get into it, Stuart will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Well, thank you, Stuart. Now, before we get going, I should say that we are recording this on Thursday night in London when US markets are still open. And so all the data we will be reporting are as of Thursday night. OK, the news. Well, the big news of the week, sadly, was that UK CPI massively missed expectations. It fell from March, but was still very bad at 8.7%. And what has spooked the market is that core inflation actually rose to a new high of 6.8%. It seems that we are in the midst of a wage price spiral in the UK. And I have got that completely wrong. It would seem that, yes, indeed, we are headed towards stagflation at the moment. And we will be discussing that in some depth. So, Food price inflation in the UK fell slightly to 19% and remains extremely high. Now, part of the reason that the April rise in inflation was so bad was that April represents the new financial year and there was lots of contracts, particularly of communications, which were indexed to inflation. So high inflation of the double digits was then reflected in new contract prices in April. Good news is that the UK energy cap will fall from its current £3,288 per annum to £2,074 in July. Now that is deflation and it's forecast to fall further in October. As we go through, we will show you the latest charts of UK and European natural gas prices. They've fallen sharply this week. And the worry actually in Europe is that natural gas prices may go negative in the summer. That would be a turnaround. The IMF has upgraded UK growth forecasts and predicts that UK will avoid recession but has warned, and this was prescient, that UK inflation is in danger of becoming persistent and has recommended that interest rates stay higher for longer. Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, has admitted that there are very big lessons to learn from its failure to predict the surge in inflation and has suggested its models have not allowed for changes in behaviour in the face of large food and energy price shocks. I think we are all aware of that. So, uh, Keith, is it true that's why Richard is not available? He's on secondment to the B of E just to perform their <laughs> models? I wish. <laughs> that would sort them out. <laughs> There's uh, still no debt ceiling deal in the US, although... Reuters are reporting tonight that the two sides are very close and a deal may be announced tomorrow, but they've said that before. In the meantime, Fitch has warned on the US's credit rating. And finally, in a bit of tit-for-tat geopolitical tension, China has banned the US chipmaker Micron from Chinese infrastructure projects. Okay, some... <clears throat> Charts related to the news, well, it would appear the markets believe that X date is next Friday, the 1st of June. So if you look at the yield on the 30th of May T-bill, you'll see it's been falling. The one on the 1st of June has been going through the moon. So next Friday, big day. They need to get a deal before then. And... <clears throat> 
This week has seen lots of Fed governors giving speeches and the blue line is where the outlook for US rates as discussed or forecast by bullish Fed governor Jimmy Bullard and the red line is what the market is actually pricing. Now the market is slowly moving up as it comes to realize the Fed is serious. It, the last time we had a debt ceiling drama was under the Obama administration back in 2011. And what happened after the deal was reached? Well, it wasn't great, actually. Stocks did badly. Now, regular viewers of the podcast will know that there's a very strong correlation between liquidity and the performance of the stock market. And after the debt ceiling has been resolved, the US will be issuing lots of bonds to refill the TGA account. And that will suck liquidity out of the market. And that will cause stocks to fall if historic correlations hold. And surprisingly, yields fell hard. Although inflation was no worry back then, whether yields will fall when inflation is this high is an, an open question. Now, turning to the UK, well, UK inflation came in hot and the market is now expecting UK interest rates to keep on rising throughout 2023. Now, reminder, the UK benchmark currently 4.5%, and the market is now pricing in almost a whole percentage point of further rises over the rest of the year because the UK has an inflation problem. So the yellow line is the US, where inflation is well down from its peaks and on a declining path. The UK is the black line and is well above every other jurisdiction. And if you look at core inflation, this is a really worrying chart. It's rising and has hit new highs. Elsewhere, Germany is officially in recession after two quarters of negative GDP growth. And last night, NVIDIA which we have previously talked about as having an absolutely ludicrous P.E. ratio and price to sales ratio. Well, its share price surged 25 percent on the back of Q1 earnings, which were 50 percent better than forecast. And that puts it on a P.E. ratio of 373. OK, and turning to this week's economic data. so. Well, the big news in the UK was inflation CPI was forecast at 8.2%, came in at 87 So down on March, but still very high and well above expectations. Month on month, it rose by 1.2%. Core CPI was frankly even worse. It was forecast to be flat at 6.2%. It rose substantially to 6.8%, a new high. Inflation is becoming embedded in the UK. The Bank of England's interest rates are just not slowing the economy enough. So month on month, core was up 1.3%. That is a really bad number. RPI only slightly missed expectations, actually. It was a forecast at 11.1%, came in at 11.4%, well down on March. Month on month, though, again, a terrible number, 1.5%. The good news was on the factory output and input prices. So PPI output, which is output from factory gates, missed expectations at 5.4%, well down on March. Input prices also missed massively below March at 3.9%. So goods inflation is coming down in the UK. 
Now we also had the CBI industrial trends and that was slightly better than expected, but still pretty awful at minus 17. And we had PMIs. Now, the PMIs in the UK and Europe are quite similar. So they show weak and weakening manufacturing and services, which are still strong, but also weakening, leading to a composite and both the EU and UK, which was lower than forecast and is declining once again. So the bounce we've seen in Q1 appears to be fading, but both the UK and the EU are still in expansion. Now, the CBI Distributive Trades Index looks at retail and sales, and that was unexpectedly weak in May. So in April, it was plus five is expected to strengthen to plus 10. In fact, it came in at minus 10, suggesting that sales have weakened substantially in May. EU consumer confidence was worse than expected, but slightly up on April. OK, turning to the US, we had PMIs and the May services PMI massively beat expectations. It was expected to weaken slightly to 52.6. It beat that and expanded from April into May at 55.1. So services in the US shows no sign of slowing down. Manufacturing, on the other hand, was a substantial miss. It was expected to fall from 50.2 in April to 50. It fell to 48.5 and is back in contraction territory. But overall, the composite beat expectations and was up on April. Now, we also had the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. And in April, that missed expectations coming in at 0.07. What's interesting was they revised downwards the March number. Previously, it was minus 0.19. It's revised down substantially to minus 0.37. We also had some quarterly data. And <clears throat> I won't go through all of this, but in general, the inflation numbers for Q1, and they said these are all the second estimate, they beat expectations and that is bad means that the fed has not got inflation as much under control as it would like but i thought the really interesting piece of data was corporate profits which according to the national accounts data came in at minus 6.8 percent now we know from the s p 500 that <clears throat> in aggregate they're saying earnings actually rose over the court quarter. So who is right? Some charts. Stuart. Right. So this is the UK and manufacturing. And I think we're going to this is a good example of what we're going to see in many cases, which is manufacturing bad services are good or, or acceptable. So um, yeah, UK uh, coming off there, uh, whereas services I guess it's come off a bit in the past month, but actually not too bad a picture. Yeah, that's quite a good number. Uh, and therefore the composite, which I, I presume is going to be more heavily weighted to services than manufacturing, is also pretty decent. Yeah. Uh, and here, here's the um, horrible numbers. Uh, UK CPI year on year. Yes, it's peaked, but it's not falling half as much as other countries or half as much as expected. Still very painful. And looking at that month on month, no evidence of, of any slowdown there. If anything, an acceleration, very yeah. painful. 1.2% month on month. Yeah, awful. And this, this is the absolutely double awful, isn't it? The core CPI is still accelerating. It's just uh, absolutely, uh, yeah, the, the Bank of England has, as you say, sort of lost control of this. And uh, yeah. what that's likely to mean for, for rates is, is, is obvious. It's going to be higher for longer. I mean, the interesting thing to me when we talk about a wage price spiral is, well, most of the wage settlements that I hear about are in the sort of five, six percent range, um, which is still um, 
behind uh, CPI and certainly way behind RPI inflation. So that is what uh, Hugh Pill was talking about, isn't it? You know, that is uh, one section of the economy that is taking the pain, that is taking yeah. the hit. Yeah, there, there are real wage contractions. <laughs> Well, true, but the FT had a story today about, um, I think it was Aldi, who have raised their wages by, I think, 11%. Wow, right. Yeah. yeah. So that is the problem the Bank of England faces. And the trouble is that a lot of pay agreements are indexed to inflation or reference inflation implicitly or explicitly. And so... As inflation stays high, so you have this feedback loop. Interesting. I knew that was the case in the 70s. There was that explicit link. Um, yeah. I thought that that had um, been, been somewhat broken. But uh, if that's the case, that, that's going to make it a very intractable problem. Well, I think the, the trouble is the Bank of England seems to believe that it can bring inflation under control without really slowing the economy. And all this data shows that, frankly, it can't. It's behind the curve and it needs to raise interest rates. Now, after this shock, I think it needs to raise by 50 basis points in June to get ahead of the curve. But I just can't see that happening. I think it will keep on going with 25 basis points. And it's just, you know, when um, inflation is 8.7% and cause at 6.8% and rising, and they're at four and a half, they're just too far behind the curve. Yep, it's going to be painful. Uh, and here's RPI, goodness. Um, yeah, Keith, just, just picking up on RPI and your linkers bet. Um, yeah. How much longer are the linkers linked to RPI before they switch to, to CPI? 2030. No. Okay. So if you buy, we'll talk about this later when I go through my portfolio, but if you buy um, TR24, the 20, 2024 index link gilt, and inflation RPI continues at this level, you will get 10% over the coming year, tax-free. Uh, PPI output prices, right. So this is definitely a reflection of the manufacturing weakness that we that we've been highlighting in those surveys. When I look at that, that's that's coming down very fast, uh, just a, a smidge above five percent now. And input prices um, rising even less fast than that. So um, clearly, you know, the, the the pig has gone gone through the python, hasn't it? And, yeah. Um, now we're left with underlying lack of demand and uh, and uh, much weaker inflation well everyone Stuart, uh richard in particular has been talking about stagflation i've been saying we can't have stagflation as long as the bank of england is committed to getting um inflation back to two percent well so far frankly richard's right and i'm wrong because basically the bank of england has shown itself not sufficiently committed to the fight and so, well, yeah, you, you put up a chart before about the change in rate expectations now looking like five and a half percent by Christmas. But yeah. that, that's still you know, a couple of percent um, negative real interest rates. Yeah. Uh, so UK core inflation remains sticky. There's a different chart showing that the same sort of problem, but there's no rolling over um, yeah. on core for services. And uh, it, it's looking very grim. In terms of the components of what drove the reduction in CPI inflation, albeit um, uh, the, the core is still very painful. Uh, housing and household services were the, the main negative contributor. Uh, so this is utility bills, is it, coming yes, off? that's right, energy bills coming off. Yeah. So the, the big hike in energy bills was this time last year. Um, but what's interesting is communication and recreation and culture, you know, the communication was um, lots of mobile phone bills, which were in, you know, indexed explicitly to our uh, inflation. Painful, isn't it? I, I signed up to one knowing that it was going to be annoying. And then, of course, you know, you, it's over a 10 percent increase. Um, well, that's so right. Because I, I, I exactly like you, Stuart. I got a text showing me my latest bill and I actually went today and tried to change my bill. You know, trying to change my provider, I should say, and I'm locked in until August, but then I'm going to do it. <laughs> Will you please report back on your, your live consumer experience? 
Yeah. Because that, that would be very, very interesting. Yeah, it's painful, isn't it? I mean, I invested in some REITs for their supposed inflation linkage. I should have been invested in Vodafone. Yeah. Right. Um, this is the flight path for inflation. Uh, market implied year on year RPI, presumably derived from uh, the linkers market. Yeah. Um, which is showing a very comfortable picture whereby uh, in a year's time, April 24, our RPI will be just 4%. Um, we will see. Yeah. Well, what's noticeable is the market doesn't believe the Bank of England that inflation will come down to 5.4% by the end of the year. It says it'll come down to 63 now, obviously, the market is reflexive. So the Bank of England can affect this if it so chooses. You know, if it decides to raise rates stronger than the market's expecting, it can get, bring inflation down. With a lag. Yeah. Uh, UK true inflation. Um, oh, it's taken a bit of a step change down, isn't it? From over 16 to just 14%. So... Um... Mm. Well, perhaps an early sign. So. Yeah. US true inflation is below four. A UK CBI industrial trends. So picking up a bit, but still um, very weak. So this is the distributive companies, is it? No, this it's not. Retail? This is um, this is industrial. So this is uh, manufacturing. Oh, OK. So this is a, another example of weak manufacturing. Um, the story, which is throughout the uh, the, the survey data. Our UK car production. Oh, it's above zero. Um, right, but uh, clearly, a, well, I, I would say there's a step change down there you know, mm. from the 2014 to 2018 period uh, yeah. where we're you know, bumping up to 150,000. Now it's looking more like an average of uh, 70,000. And presumably that's annual, is it? Uh, these are month, that's monthly data. Goodness, right. Uh, yeah, so, um, and Perhaps for, it's my political opinion, but one could blame Brexit, couldn't we? No, I think, well, I think that's absolutely true. It's like added paperwork and, you know, there are international supply chains and you're throwing sand into them. Yep. Uh, oh, so this is the distributive trades um, survey. Again, looking at a very weak chart. There, there's no, no real sign of um, vibrancy there, is there? Yeah, actually, I'm just going to read this out. So this is the commentary. The retail sales balance in the UK as indicated by the CBI Distributive Trade Survey, dropped to minus 10 in May compared to the previous month's figure of plus 5. This result fell short, well short of expectations, which had anticipated a reading of plus 10. The latest reading pointed to a contraction in trade during the current month following a modest increase in April due to acute price pressures, with inflation remaining at historically high levels over the 12-month period. Additionally, the CBI reported decline in retail employment for the third consecutive quarter with a significant drop to minus 48 in the year ending May, signaling the largest decline since February 2009. Now, actually, some data, some private data that Richard and I have, because we have an angel investment in a payments company, which has a lot of exposure to the retail, retail sector, is that there does seem to have been substantial drop in expenditure and retail activity, leisure activity, since the end of the Easter holidays. And what we think is going on is that family budgets are stressed and they saved up for the Easter holidays. And after the Easter holidays, they've cut back. So let's see what happens when we get May retail sales data. Uh, now, here's the EU construction output year on year. This, I think, is a prime example of something we're going to see for years, which is um, the impact of COVID on charts and chart crime. Mm. It's very difficult to, to look at the scale here properly. But yeah. uh, I think the key point is uh, construction output is now at negative year on year in the EU. Uh, EU consumer confidence. Um, this is always a, a fun chart, isn't it? Just talking about how <laughs> depressed everyone is in Europe. Um, they're less depressed. Uh, yeah. We've gone from almost minus 30 depression to about minus 17 depression. Mm. Yeah, still not great, but they're always depressed. This number famously never gets to zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
uh, EU services PMI. Now, I see quite a lot of this data is now attributed to HCOB. Do, do you know yeah. who that is? That's, uh, well, that's it used to be is. S&P Global. And I, I don't know, they've rebounded it. I don't, don't understand, but, you know, comes out on the same day as the other S&P Global data, so... And uh, well, I, I, this is the picture we've been talking about. It's weakened very fractionally, but basically, services looking pretty healthy. Is anything um, to do with manufacturing and industrial production that's suffering? Yeah. Talking of which, here we go. That's the story. Manufacturing looking very weak indeed. And therefore, the composite weighted towards services, not too bad. Um, the US uh, PMI. Uh, not not bad at all, but again, services, uh, 55. I mean, that would be a pretty respectable number. That looks a um, uh, decent expansion. Yeah. But manufacturing, not. It's a very consistent story, surprisingly. Uh, and given that balance of services being strong, uh, manufacturing being weak, the, the composite is not too bad at all, uh, about 55. Uh, the U.S. Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index, well, it's it's a consistent story for once. The data is not misaligned, uh, a, a very poor reading on that. Um, excluding the, the COVID spike down is one of the worst readings for, for years. Yeah, and the trend is definitely down. Services uh, has bounced back, not as strongly as in the other survey, but um, a reasonably consistent story. U.S. new home sales. Well, this is a surprise, isn't it? I mean, um, you yeah. would think with U.S. Uh, mortgage rates, I know it's a, a big topic for, for further discussion, but um, the basic data on new home sales is surprisingly encouraging in the States. Yeah, amazing. Given home affordability, we have a big section coming up on U.S. housing, but home affordability is awful. So how on earth is this work this happening? Because we know that uh, mortgage applications are running at very low levels. It's difficult to, to understand, isn't it? You would mm. you could understand some sort of pent-up demand with, from people who were desperate to move, but uh, you would have thought that that would have happened in the past you know, six months and not be evident uh, continually, but mm. that, that's a strong number. It is. New home sales month on month. Okay, last month's numbers being revised down from 9.6 to 4%, some of the steam taken out of it, but you can't deny that that is, is a pretty uh, positive um, set of numbers over the past six months. It is. Contrary to, to all expectations. Yeah, again, something I got totally wrong. I was expecting you know, very high interest rates and high house prices combining to be terrible uh, home affordability. You know, that should slow the housing market, and it hasn't. So this obviously is new homes. Do different people buy new homes than buy existing homes? Something for further yeah. discussion. Mm, don't know. Uh, Johnson Redbook retail sales, awful. I mean, if this is nominal dollars of 2%, then um, in real terms, that's what, minus four or something? Yeah. And um, uh, for further later discussion, but here is the US mortgage rate. Um, uh, heading towards 7%. Yeah. The mortgage market index uh, remaining uh, very weak, as you would ex expect it. The, the mystery is why it's not leading into uh, weaker home sales. Exactly. US pending home sales year on year. Oh, well, this is an interesting chart, isn't it? At minus 20, which is better than it used to be of minus 40. Mm. Now, this, of course, will presumably be existing stock as well as new homes so that's a differentiation we need to be yes. uh, conscious of uh, pending home sales month on month well that's that's reconfirming the, the that weak picture from the previous chart uh us uh, chicago fed national activity index ah uh, this is the number which was uh, revised i think you were talking mm. about before so um fractionally positive 0.07 Unfortunately, I have no idea how this is created. But, uh, no, neither do I. But, you know, um, April was a better month. U.S. initial jobless claims. Well, it, it's not bursting higher, is it? Um, at least as far as this is concerned. Um, we've taken a step up from 2022, but it's not, um, it's not to the moon, is it? Um, no, it, absolutely. And actually, flat. they revised last week's number down. Continuing jobless claims. Well, it's risen, 
but now it appears to have plateaued. So yeah. there's no sharp deceleration. Exactly. So in summary, UK uh, inflation was awful. Headline CPI fell less than expected, is at 8.7%. The real shocker was that core CPI continued to rise, it's now at 6.8%. In terms of the PMIs in the UK and Europe, manufacturing is weak, services not too bad at all. Uh, US, um, again, services fine, manufacturing pretty weak. And uh, US jobless claims not really showing much evidence uh, of a slowdown in the jobs market as yet. Yes. And the market is increasingly anticipating that the US will raise rates again in June. Okay, thank you, Stuart. On to one chart. And this is from The Economist. And what it shows is how companies in Europe and the US have been using their cash flow. And you'll see for the last decade, they have been spending more than they've made. And they've been spending heavily on buybacks and dividends as well as capital expenditure and mergers and acquisitions. Now, in the long term, that can't continue. And they have basically taken on a lot of debt when interest rates were low to fund all this excess expenditure. And now that, those debts will need to be refinanced in the coming years at higher interest rates, which will reduce profitability something has to give so what are they going to cut back on buybacks and dividends or on capital expenditure and mergers and acquisitions just on this um I, i'm seeing more and more references to something that people have called greedflation uh but also uh, to the high level of margins particularly in in us stocks uh, and this brings to mind um almost like a cultural point. Julian Tett would be good on this if she wrote about it in the FT. But it, it seems to me that over the past 10, 20 years, management have really got religion in terms of cash flow return on investment as being the metric that they need to be focused on. But what, what historically that might have meant was a focus on improving cash flow, I think has now become much more nuanced. And one issue is well, you can improve your cash flow return on investment by reducing the uh, denominator. You just make yes. less investment. Mm. And I think that's what we're seeing in, the, in that CapEx chart there, that you can, if you're focused on producing more cash flow and becoming a sort of capital allocator um, chief executive, then you're not necessarily going to um, prioritize business, fundamental business investment. And if everyone is sort of having the same um, cultural mindset, then that is maybe one reason why sectors and industries are becoming more um, oligopolistic. Oligol yeah, you know, what am I trying to yes. say? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. There are but fewer and fewer competitors. So uh, just three or four um, telecoms companies, for instance. So yeah. it does improve your cash flow return on investment. But it doesn't do much for underlying um, productive capacity. Yes. Now, there's a very good book I'd recommend to everyone called uh, the, the Myth of Capitalism by Jonathan Tepper, which talks all about how um, weak competition policy on both sides of the Atlantic has allowed oligolis, oligolop, <laughs> oligolop, Sorry, I've led you down the wrong oligopolies, <laughs> oligopolies to uh, develop on both sides of the Atlantic as essentially there's been the large companies have swallowed all their competitors. So you have far fewer, you have much greater uh, industrial co um, concentration, which allows pr pricing power. But we also did a section a few weeks ago on how companies in the US in particular had been buying back lots of shares and your point to juice up their share price, because if you reduce the number of shares and your profits remain the same, then earnings per share rise, share price goes up. And saddling the companies with debt 
they are rewarded on the performance of the share price. So the executives all get paid out. They then leave and the companies are left with a huge load of debt and the share price tends to stagnate from there. So the question then is, are the executive basically um, rewarding themselves at the expense of shareholders by trying to juice the share price temporarily to get um, their compensation? Absolutely. It's a really big fear, isn't it? The, um, you know, as an investor in an index fund, for instance, you, you're, you're suffering that sort of overall uh, dilution from that overall corporate uh, chief executive behavior. Okay. And last week, we were talking about the HMRC payrolls number. Now, reminder, this was dr a dramatic number. It showed a huge drop in HMRC payrolls. And you, we know from other data on the UK economy that there wasn't a huge slowdown in the economy. Um, and, you know, you've just seen the PMIs. PMIs weaken slightly, but, you know, that is 0.45% of all HMRC payrolls. It's an absolutely enormous number. So what's going on? Well, I've got three theories. And Stuart, I'd like your opinion on these. First of all, there was a sudden slowdown in the economy, leading to a large increase in redundancies. And that would be bad for the economy, but good for inflation, because that means there's some slack coming into the labor market. Now, I had a long telephone conversation with one of our viewers, Martin B, this week, and we had a good chat. And his theory is that there was a large rise in benefits in April due to historic inflation becoming reflected in the benefit system. And that has incentivized a large number of people to retire early and leave the workforce. If that's true, that would be bad for the economy and bad for inflation because it means that the labor market is actually tightening. And finally, the financial year ends on the 31st of March for many companies and many leases expired on that date. And now this is from personal experience. I have a friend who works in private equity and he owns a pub and the pub was on lease to a brewing company and the lease expired on the 31st of March. And on the 31st of March, they handed back the keys. And so the pub had kept going through COVID and was, you know, profitable enough to keep going until the lease ran out. But when the lease came up for renewal, they decided to close the business. And I wonder whether that has happened throughout the economy. Now, if that is true, then that's bad for the economy, but good for inflation because those are genuine redundancies rather than people leaving the workforce voluntarily. Thank you to Martin B for his email and his contribution. Stuart, what do you think? Well, if I had to pick, I would go for, with number three. I'm trying to think if there's a, a, a fourth explanation, but um, fourth explanation is probably data error somewhere on a sp yes. Excel spreadsheet. Um, number one doesn't seem likely. We haven't seen that in any of the other uh, survey evidence, have we? Uh, number two, well, it, it, it could be, but that would seem to be, like, be a money illusion. And given all the publicity about high inflation, food prices, uh, et cetera. I mean, okay, perhaps your pension's been uprated by 10%, your state pension, that is. But um, I, I would have thought people would be more worried about endemic inflation and would be holding on to their, their jobs and immediate income you know, for, for longer. Could, could be. I mean, it's difficult to predict people's um, uh, motivations and money illusion is a, is a known phenomenon. So uh, number three seems more likely to me. That, yeah. um, but equally, your point, it could just be a bad data point. Yeah. And on to financial crisis watch, Stuart. Right. Well, here's the S&P Regional Bank ETF. Obviously, regional banks are the centre of the uh, sort of mini financial crisis in the US. 
Uh, bounced back a bit, but that's not uh, a very stunning recovery. It, it's not a clear story one way or the other. I mean, I wouldn't want to, mm. to, to take the bet. I know you've um, spoken yourself about uh, don't go bottom fishing in flaky financials. And yeah. um, this would appear to be a case in point. Bank deposits, um, well, a, a bit weaker, not no no catastrophe there. I mean, again, I would have thought most people would be, if they're paying any attention, would have, would have their money in a money market fund. But there's nothing like a few uh, weeks ago where there was very hefty withdrawals. Yeah, but again, just steady withdrawals from the banking system. Loans and leases, weekly change, um, coming back towards zero. So again, no no immediate crisis. Yeah, but negative. I mean, I think that's the point. We, we talked about the credit impulse a while ago. You know, if loans and leases just don't grow at the same pace that they did last year, then GDP falls and they're actually contracting. Real estate loans, uh, well, it's the same story you were just talking about. It might be positive, but only just. Um, mm. And obviously one can well imagine the, the, the loan officers not wanting to increase exposure to, to, to real estate at the moment. Consumer credit, um, this, this was slightly surprising. I thought that there was, had been a bit of a boom in credit card lending, but um, this is basically at zero after recovering from a sharp spike down. Mm. It is data from two or three weeks ago, though, reported every week with a one-week lag, so data the 12th of May. Commercial industrial loans monthly change. Well, that that's, looks limp, doesn't it? Obviously, the scale is somewhat distorted, but um, that, mm. that does not look very encouraging. Yeah, the credit impulse there is most de definitely negative. So presumably all that data is from banks. So this emerging world of sort of shadow finance is, is not yes. captured. That's, that's the whole point. It, it, it's yeah. shadow. Right, so uh, Western Alliance Bank. So um, the, the shares in this bank um, surged after it actually reported increased deposits, um, which obviously is the big issue. Will there be a run on deposits uh, at uh, regional banks? But how did it do this? My goodness, it had to offer over 5% on a high yield savings account. Um, where previously uh, interest rates were, were much more like 0.5%. That's huge, isn't it? That's almost scary if they only increase their deposits by mm. a fairly modest amount. If you suddenly, I suppose there's going to be some lag in the system, but uh, 5%, yeah. Yeah, it's just unprofitable at that, those levels. Yeah. Well, quite. I mean, it might be a, a temporary measure. In the UK, we're very familiar with um, teaser rates yeah. and... Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah bonuses that, that disappear after three, six or 12 months. But mm. obviously yeah, a bank can't have such a narrow spread between what it's paying depositors and what it's earning on its loans and, and investments. So yeah, a, a absolute squeeze. So, uh, so what's this one, Keith? Well, uh, Pacific West, now there are two or three Pacific Wests, aren't there? Right. I believe there's, there's quite a bit of sort of share price confusion in these cases where some stocks are being hit because they've got a similar name. Um, right. so well, trouble. but again, it's just the same story, Stuart. So, you know, a week ago, they were offering 4%. This week is 5.15%. You know, in order to retain on grow deposits, they are having to raise interest rates and that solves their liquidity crisis, but causes a profitability problem. And so the Financial crisis in small regional banks in the US is just ongoing. It's grinding away in the back there, background. And this would be very, oh, sorry, Keith. Um, well, this will be very interesting in terms of the banks better understanding how rate sensitive their depositors really are. I and mean, if you mm. offer something uh, at a reasonable quasi market rate and uh, a few, you know, sort of rate hogs you know, take it up, but you would then find how much of your deposit base is actually not uh, rate sensitive. Yes, yes, good point. Right, so uh, lending standards are continuing to tighten. I can totally see that. I think if I was a lending officer, I would be in conservatism mode for sure. So um, you know, here we go, Fed fund rate uh, uh, in blue and the 
red line um, is the net percentage of respondents reporting tighter lending standards. Obviously, that well, that they, they often go um, roughly in parallel. And um, yeah, rates up, but so not just the price of credit, but the availability of credit are also being uh, squeezed. Uh, another take on the credit conditions index, um, a very or oh, pretty reasonable correlation uh, here. Um, this is a different measure, I think, of uh, credit conditions. Um, but again, it's making the same point that uh, credit growth is going to follow with a lag from a change in the credit conditions index. And the, the, the message is things are going to get very tight. Yes. Uh, banks are still borrowing from the Fed, suggesting that there are underlying de um, deposit problems. Now, is this the, the new uh, program that they were... Uh, offering where you, you could place yes. your treasuries at, at, at par back and get cash back from the Fed. Yeah, that's right. the black line. Right. The, Whereas the borrowing from the discount window has, has dropped away, but yes. this this other program is being yeah. taken up. And that's very expensive. But frankly, if the Pack West is offering 5%, well, actually, it's going to cost you the best part of 5% to lend for, to borrow from the Fed. So... Margin. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. But, you know, either way, you're destroying your profitability. Uh, corporate bond market um, is surprisingly relaxed. This is, I think, the overall um, corporate bond uh, option adjusted spread. So, you know, no crisis there. Now, I believe, remember when I was on a few months ago, I, I had a report, I was uh, repeating a report from an investment manager talking about particular trigger levels where one should sort of buy into uh, distressed debt um, spreads of about 600 basis points. Obviously, that's not the overall corporate bond spread, but that was um, high yield spread. And I've been looking at that recently. Nothing like that. It's um, The yeah. market is amazingly uh, tolerant of the current economic conditions. Yeah. So in summary, bank deposits do seem to be continuing to flow out of the banking system. And I would say, just as importantly, uh, loan growth is weak and looks like it's going to get even weaker given those measures of uh, credit, uh, of loan officer standards. And as Keith has been highlighting over the past few uh, episodes, the credit impulse here is going to be very negative because it's not just um, whether loans are growing, it's whether they're growing faster than they grew uh, this time last year. So if, in fact, they're shrinking, you're going to get a double whammy. Um, tightening of credit. Yes. Thank you, Stuart. And on to debt ceiling watch. Well, just some background. So US federal tax receipts are actually down 6% year on year, which I found amazing, frankly, given that nominal uh, prices and wages have risen very strongly. Is that I'd like to see that as a as a an absolute number, given that it might be you know coming reflecting a, some strange annual event one year ago where we got that plus thirty. Yeah. But yeah, on the face of it, it looks very surprising. Well, federal spending, on the other hand, is up seven percent. So that's leading to a deficit this year of almost two trillion dollars. I. Biden is being totally irresponsible. We're now at the arguably the peak of this cycle and the deficit's meant to be towards its lows for the cycle. So well, I mean, uh, to, to me, I'm afraid it's a plague on both their houses that uh, whenever there's been attempts to control the deficit with Clinton and Obama, it, then those, um, uh, those reduced deficits have been given away in tax cuts by Republicans when they're in. I mean, yeah. that, it strikes me that, that there's you, you need a benign dictator to sort this out because you, you, you're not going to be able to get it from the political system. Yeah. And as a result, the interest expense is going through the moon. So, you know, they need to get this sorted. They need to start putting in place the measures now to bring expenditure under control and also to repeal the tax cuts etc to increase government revenue and the tga was down to 
116 billion as of last Friday, and it's well down from that now. So the market is anticipating that the US will run out of money next Friday. Watch this space. And on to Inflation Watch, Stuart. Well, I think we've covered a lot of this already, haven't we? And we've been going on about uh, the UK um, CPI, core CPI and RPI numbers being terrible. Um, uh, Japan, there's also some data there, CPI at 3.5% um, in April, um, core CPI 3.4%. I think we're all waiting to see what the new governor of the Bank of Japan does, if anything, because um, that, that appears to be another sort of big accident waiting to happen. Yeah. Well, I noticed that both numbers were up on March. Uh, global goods deflation is on its way. Uh, lots of charts here, uh, which I think are very much echoing the, the PMIs, which is manufacturing goods, anything real, anything tangible. It's all rolled over. There's a lot of weakness out there in terms of final demand and therefore uh, pricing power uh, has evaporated. Uh, it, to me, I keep thinking the pig has gone through the python. We're, we're yeah. settling back to some fundamental underlying demand. And so that there's all this whipsaw effect going on. Yeah. A consensus forecast for um, core PCE uh, in the States. Uh, so this is core PCE um, is, mm -hmm. is still rising. So latest forecast is 4.1% for 2023. Yeah. So this suggests that the market doesn't believe the Fed's got inflation under control. And I don't quite see how this squares with market expectations. The Fed is going to cut by cut twice later in the year. Well, uh, this is this is economists forecast. It's not right. the, it's not market pricing. I mean, when you think yeah. about it, this apparently um, shows that in January this year, the forecast for 2023 CPI was three and a half percent. Seems to me this is more about economists gradually getting to grips with reality. Mm. Well, they and me. Uh, so U.S. import prices now showing deflation. I think this is another version of the, the slowdown in manufacturing story that, we, that we've been covering. So minus 4.8 percent import price uh, import, import prices for the U.S. Richmond Fed survey shows that manufacturing wage growth is collapsing. Um, all of a piece with this story that we keep going on about um, manufacturing and industrial production uh, being weak. Uh, pricing power for workers are therefore uh, being much weaker. And, and here we're seeing it. Yeah, still a pretty decent number, though. Plus 17. Uh, the Atlanta Fed uh, wage growth tracker, a uh, monthly change minus 1.4%. Hmm. So further evidence mm. of, of weakness. Obviously, incredibly volatile chart, but it, it yeah. is the lowest number uh, for many years. Yeah. Now, this one surprised me. Rental price inflation, again, in the US, is now pretty much zero. So there was the big surge, which uh, had a lot of uh, comments everywhere, but that, that's now um, all gone into reverse. Well, not, not quite to reverse, more, more flat from here. Mm. And obviously, we've, we've spoken before about how um, shelter price uh, inflation gets incorporated in US CPI, i.e. with a lag. Yes. So this, this is basically saying that uh, that element, which is about a third of US CPI, is going to be having uh, a deflationary pressure over the next, uh, next six months. Uh, home prices posted their biggest drop since April 2012, um, according to the Redfin data, which is more what we'd be expecting. Um, uh, mm -hmm. In the US, I think there are other data series showing it's not not quite so bad, but uh, on this data, at least, we're seeing what we expected, um, which is uh, interest rates up, mortgage rates up, house prices down. Uh, this was an interesting blast from the past, the monetary data. Uh, US M2 fell by 4.6% year on year in April. Again, possibly some year on year comparison effects. What's going on a year ago? Is there money printing going on? Is there any special special measures? But uh, and that is a very difficult number for for markets to to take. If if short term market prices are influenced so much by liquidity, that's going to be painful. Yeah, but that's equity markets seem to be doing just fine. They do, don't they? 
Global inflation is falling. Um, we're here showing main economies. So the UK isn't on this chart. We've got Korea, US, Japan, and China all uh, showing very uh, big reductions in uh, PPI, in particular in China. Yeah. So in summary, US inflation is definitely rolling over, looking reasonably encouraging. UK inflation, however, is very sticky. Um, the high inflation in April was exacerbated by inflation indexation of Keith's mobile phone contract. Um, Bank of England has definitely not got inflation under control, and UK inflation is likely to fall, but slowly, more slowly than anywhere else, and anyone else had predicted. Yeah, particularly me. And on to recession watch. So the Deutsche Bank US recession model is forecasting a recession there with um, and it's saying with 100% probability. And actually, it has seemingly a very good track record. If you look back, the gray bars are recessions. And one thing we've been puzzling over is the difference between coincident indicators and leading indicators. And this chart shows the difference between the two. And it turns out that the difference in between the two tends to spike just before recessions and is itself a, a, a recession forecaster. So it's forecasting a recession pretty soon. And the conference board leading indicator has now been in decline for 13 consecutive months. And the Citigroup U.S. Economic Surprise Index has drifted down towards neutral, having been positive for a few months. Although the Bloomberg Economic Surprise Index completely contradicts that and says that things have been improving quite sharply. Who knows? Now, one thing that we've talked about previously is that the first jobs that get cut when industries slow down is temp agencies and consultancy staff. And this chart shows payrolls for temp services and they're falling. And McKinsey, et cetera, are cutting staff. So that suggests business businesses are cutting costs. Now, this is data on payments to small companies in the US going via the payment system. So ACH is the clearinghouse. And that's the dark blue line. And you can see revenues into US small companies are in decline, in steady decline. So that should eventually lead through to job cuts and economic weakness. And consumer sentiment in the US fell sharply in May. It's been low for a while. It's declining again. And what's different this time is that also seems to be translating into falling consumer spending. You see retail sales have been falling with showed you previously the Johnson Red Book numbers, which have been steady decline. And retail sales after adjusting for inflation are four, minus 4.2% year on year. And the savings rate in the US is normalizing, which suggests that consumers have largely spent their pandemic stimulus checks. Although we'll talk about this further, Actually, their cash balances on aggregate are much better than pre-pandemic. Credit card balances have shown very strong growth year on year, despite credit card interest rates being at a record high, above 20%. Now, this is the latest credit card spending data. If you look, I've circled this bottom chart in red leisure spending is falling off a cliff 
and spending on clothing. They've all been pretty flat declining recently. The total spend falling sharply in the last few weeks. But spending on leisure, that's discretionary spending, has really fallen. So are we finally seeing the US consumer weakening? Now, the reason that the US consumer seems to be able to put it all on the plastic is that their debt service payments as a percentage of disposable income look all right, frankly. They've... Yeah, I wouldn't mind having a 30 year mortgage at you know, 3% and having that yeah. locked in and then having an inflation pay rise. Exactly. Used vehicle uh, prices are rolling over. And I listened to a very interesting podcast by somebody in the um, auto industry in the US during the week, and he was predicting predicting doom and gloom and a disaster in that space because during the pandemic lots of consumers bought very overpriced cars on credit and now find that the value of those cars has declined a lot and they can't refinance them and they're handing back the keys now so what he's saying is that lots of the banks and the car companies so the um second-hand vehicle um, companies have got loads of inventory, but they don't want to put it all on the market now because that will kill prices. So they will drip feed it out over the course of the year. So he's predicting a steady decline in vehicle prices. And new vehicle prices also appear to have peaked, although they are up one hell of a lot than pre-COVID. Was that 38 Previously, 48 now. Wow. Yeah. Now, the Bank of America have this global wave chart, and it predicts, you know, the business cycle, basically. And they're saying that the business cycle is now in a downturn and we're just about to go negative. But cyclical jobs in the US have not really started to downturn at all. And so I don't think we'll have a recession until that changes. And the Fed's favorite bond market recession signal is to look at the 18 month forward three year, three month yield minus the spot three month yield. And that is very much signaling a coming recession. Household wealth in the US is now down year on year, and that normally signals reduction in consumer confidence and a recession as consumers then look to rebuild their finances by cutting spending and increasing saving. Let's see whether that happens. Turning to the Eurozone, well, this is manufacturing new orders. That's not happy. After bouncing a bit, it's turned down decisively again. And if you look at PMI's minus new orders, you'll see that that has spiked, which means it's likely to turn down quickly once you run out of the order backlog. And the order backlog is un almost exhausted. And EU loan demand is collapsing. So we'll talk about the credit impulse. The credit impulse is going to be very poor in the Eurozone and a recession is likely in the second half of the year. So in summary, according to leading indicators and actually pretty much all the data, except for contemporaneous data, um, a US recession looks like it is fast approaching. In the Eurozone, Germany is already in recession, and a Eurozone recession looks increasingly likely in H2 when you look at the manufacturing data. Reminder, manufacturing and construction are the two sectors that lead the economy into recession. In the UK, the Bank of England and the IMF are forecasting the UK will escape recession in 2023. Frankly. If the US and the Eurozone go into recession in the second half, I just fail to see how the UK can avoid it. And on to R star. 
what is R star? Well, R star is a very good way of getting into an argument with an economist. It is theoretical and it is the new, real neutral rate of interest that equilibrates the economy in the long run. So it is the interest rate that is neither expansionary or contractionary when the economy is at full employment. So this is a theoretical measure. So when a central bank sets the base rate below R star, then the policy is accommodative and stimulatory. When it's above R star, then it's contractionary. And so R star is important for central banks in setting interest rate policy. Now, what determines R star? Well, what determines R star is the demand for credit and savings. And so the demand for de investment is a function of potential GDP growth or trend GDP growth. And the supply and demand for savings, other than for investment, is a function of demographics. Young people borrow more to invest in houses and durable goods, so they have low savings rate. Old people have a higher savings rate. Now, What's interesting is the New York Fed this week came out with its latest estimates for R star. It had stopped during them, doing them during the pandemic because it, uh, its models couldn't uh, cope with the disruption. But its new estimates actually show that R star is unchanged from pre-pandemic. And so this is their estimate of R star is in blue line and it's actually down from pre-pandemic. This trend growth is the brown line. And if you look at advanced economies, well, the bottom line is not much has changed. Demographics haven't changed. Trend growth, potential trend potential growth has also not changed. And therefore, our star hasn't changed much. So that implies that once the inflationary impulse due to the extraordinary monetary and fiscal measures caused by the pandemic have passed, then interest rates should to return to their pre pandemic levels. And so that would be very good for bond prices. And part of my investment in bonds was on the basis of this very idea. Now, it's not working out very well at the moment, but in the long run, I still believe this is true. Your thoughts, Stuart? So is this connected to the argument for secular stagnation? Yes. So things are looking weak and AI is... Uh just within the normal range of um, impacts on the uh, on the economy. We're not expecting any productivity boost from, from that. So. Mm. Mm. Well, it's very difficult to know what the productivity boost from AI will be. Um, the famously, the when um, computers became widespread, economists, I think, was it Samuelson? said that computers were turning up everywhere except in the productivity statistics. Yeah. So these things take up, up to 20 years to become fully embedded in the economy and to um, have an effect on productivity. I believe there's also something called R double star, which the FT was, was talking about, which is yes. the rate of interest the financial markets can bear. And yes. of course, if that is uh, lower than what the economy can bear, you know, we, we could have a financial crisis uh, leading to an economic crisis. 
Yeah, no, absolutely, Stuart. And um, actually, I left out our, our, our star star because I thought it'd be a bit too much complex. But that's absolutely right. And you can see that in the US in particular, that the rapid rise in interest rates is causing all sorts of financial stress. Now, in Europe, it's not obvious that that is the case. But, I, you know, part of my... Uh, assumption that very rapidly rising interest rates would cause a slowdown in the economy was because I thought it would cause uh, financial chaos. But frankly, it hasn't so far in Europe. Well, even in the States, it hasn't been that bad with the, these regional banks. It's, uh, in a sense, been quite surprising because we, we've commented in the past about just how financialized the, the world has become, mm. in particular, you know, repackaging, slicing and dicing of any real estate loan. And uh, you could well see uh, cascading accidents uh, coming from that. But so far, not really. Yep. OK, now I've got a big section coming up on the US construction market. Stuart. Right. So uh, here we have a measure of the extent to which US consumer has extended themselves for, for property or what they would have to pay. So this is... Um, the 28% rule, which apparently is what US lenders look for, that 28% um, of salary, no more than that, should go on a mortgage. However, you'll need to be spending a fair bit more than that um, if you want to uh, be buying a house in the US at the moment. 28% rule would say $1,770 a month, but you'd actually have to be paying $2,440. Um, so you would have to stretch to buy a house at the moment. It's quite an interesting measure because it seems to be more than just house price you know, times uh, interest rate. There are measures uh, covering property taxes, insurance, uh, uh, et cetera, which I think is a much cleverer, more fuller measure of the cost of ownership. Yeah. So in the UK, I think we're a bit more cavalier about what we lend. Yeah, no, in the US, the uh, property tax is a big thing very expensive so it's something that can be up to the best part of two percent of the value of property per annum so that that being the case it's unsurprising that most people don't think it's a good time to buy a house uh, in the u.s at the moment um the frequency of this data has, has picked up um uh, over its surveys and has collapsed um over the past couple of years That's totally logically that makes makes a lot of sense yeah, but we know from earlier data that um, home sales seem to be bouncing, holding up surprisingly well. Yeah, particularly the new home sales, isn't it? Um, uh, house prices are falling, at least for US existing home sales. This is the median sales price year on year is now minus 1.7% after a very strong um, spike, obviously during the, the, the pandemic, where they were increasing as much as 25% year on year. Uh, so most homeowners in the US have those 30-year fixed rate mortgages, so they're going to be locked in at much lower than the, the current 6.6%. So I think we, we can totally expect from this that there'll be much less activity uh, in the market. Who would move? You know, you, you're just not yeah. going to, are you? Yeah, exactly. They can't afford to buy their own houses at this rate. They're just going to sit there. Uh, so home sales are falling just as, as expected. It's almost like... Um, Theory is, is properly predicting practice. Very, very unusual in our world. Yeah, so, well, the so new home sales holding up just remarkably well. Yeah, yeah. This is a chart of existing home sales, isn't it? Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, it, it's just buying a new home is extremely expensive relative to, to renting. Here's a couple of measures of each of those: cost to rent, cost to buy. Um, much more expensive to, to buy. So. Uh, it, it makes total sense. I think we can all see this. Housing starts are now beginning to, to fall. I mean, frankly, the, the wonder to me is that they haven't fallen more strongly than this. Precisely. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a house builder, obviously, um, but perhaps there's lags in the system that even you know, a couple of years after the pandemic, it's taking a while for, for house builders to work through their inventory. I, I can imagine that they got a house 80% complete and needed some final parts, which were stuck mm -hmm. somehow perhaps that that's uh, finally working its way through the system but um they're falling but not as much as i would have guessed home builder confidence seems to have actually bounced so 
these are the builders themselves reckon it's not too bad a time to be uh, to be building houses so i want to you know a, a, um, a conversation with people to understand why this is yeah. the case because it, it just seems so counterintuitive um, but one measure which does suggest that um, the, uh, the crash will be longer lasting and more painful is the number of realtors. Um, that has got a pretty strong relationship to uh, home price growth and is falling very rapidly. Yeah. Well, if transaction volumes are falling, they just don't have anything to do. So yeah, it's interesting that this chart is actually home price growth rather than volumes, because as, mm, as you say, yeah. you would think volumes would be the more important metric. And there are a lot of realtors, apparently, uh, in the States. Let's have a look at this number. What are we talking? 1.5, 1.6 million um, yeah. real estate agents. So, goodness, that, that could easily halve, couldn't it? And the, the world would be a better place. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, you notice that this data says minus 4.1%, and the Charlie Bilello was minus 1.9%. So. Building permits have been falling for a year in a uh, falling for a year now. That again, you would think makes total sense. Why apply to um, increase um, your uh, the, your your obligations to, to to build houses? So again, it's a wonder that um, the home builders are th thinking that it's a reasonably decent time to start. Um, this is the composition of building permits, um, where we can see I think you know an increase in in the sense of traditional houses. For a family of um, two to four, rather than single um, mm. for, a, for a single person. So again, I quite I couldn't really come up with an immediate logic for why that would be, rather than you know a uh, building flats for people. So housing starts are substantially down according to uh, this measure from from Zonda, um, where we can see in particular uh, Texas is looking pretty bad, Dallas. Houston and, and Austin um, down by about a quarter. Oh, goodness, no, just looking further down there, there's some terrible numbers in Florida as well. Yeah. No, minus 47%. Yes, these are quite big numbers. Completions have kept rising. Again, I can totally understand you, you, you've got stock, you, you want to get it off the books by completing it, but it doesn't no. seem to have rolled over at all, has it? Well... Ah, units under construction remain near all-time highs. My goodness, that's a big divergence, isn't it, between housing starts and uh, units under construction. So again, well, where are these units being constructed from? It's not like there was a big bulge beforehand that wasn't being fulfilled by, by starts. Mm. Mm. Somewhat confusing to me. My goodness. The pandemic really clogged up supply chains and pushed up the time to complete a home to over a year, to 14 and a half months. I mean, that is massive, isn't it? Mm. So perhaps some of these anecdotes about lack of key components are, are true, and you could get a house substantially complete, but not finally complete, and therefore couldn't, um, couldn't get it off the books. Now there's the rush to, to push them out. Yeah, and this explains why. We haven't seen a drop in um, construction and employment yet because there's all these homes just needing to be completed. We finished off. Yeah, right. Uh, which is what you've just uh, illustrated in, the, in this chart here. The construction workforce is, uh, hasn't been cut because it's, it's necessary just to finish off these houses. But presumably the outlook is, is abysmal. Yeah. So uh, from 314 Research, they're, they're predicting a recession starting in November based on the current state of the construction industry. Um, I assume you would agree with that, if not a, a bit before. Um, we're in the fourth quarter. You expect that um, the credit impulse, et cetera, will really start to slow the U.S. economy. But, you know, you've seen the PMIs, Stuart. The services yep. PMI is strengthening. So an increasing number of projects have been approved, but not yet started. And that is generally the case for a recession. So perhaps um, there are projects out there which um, you know, people are interested in, but then actually stop themselves from committing capital to. And that would yeah. seem to have reached the, the right threshold measure. 
Yeah, but then again, these are extraordinary times and they've got loads of um, projects which aren't yet complete. So maybe they just don't have the capacity to start on these. Residential um, investment. This is some monthly statistics showing um, that's down by 11.6%. I'm not quite sure what res real estate investment means. Is this from the construction companies or this is purchases of uh, residential investment opportunities? Good question. Not sure. Uh, but one interesting um, data point is the, the ratio of housing inventory to population, which is actually pretty healthy, it, mm. which would suggest that there isn't uh, an underlying shortage of, of, of houses. Yeah. Something we need to see in the UK. Uh, right, well, talking of backlogs and clearing things through, um, there are a huge number of apartments under construction. Um, we can see that is, is continuing to, uh, to rise where houses have, have peaked and, and are coming off. Again, I, I could see the logic for an apartment rather than a house on, on the basis of lower nominal price and people under pressure, um, possibly even buy um, to, to let out. Mm. Uh, US consumers think mortgage rates are high and houses are overpriced. I think we would both totally agree with that, wouldn't we? Yeah. Uh, a surge in inventory of housing, uh, that tends to uh, lead to an increase in unemployment, but with a two-year lag. So again, one of these sort of construction cycle uh, effects. And again, um, more data points suggesting a pretty painful recession ahead. So despite high mortgage rates, pending home sales have risen uh, in, in the first quarter, which is this slightly sort of mysterious um, bounce. Yeah. It's not just sort of some people who are initially desperate and continued with purchases they'd set their hearts on. Uh, this is people who've had a chance to look at the market, back off, but haven't. Mm. Um, which is puzzling given that there's a collapse in mortgage, mortgage origination. Are there lots of people buying for cash, which is the only other logical explanation? Yeah. But you would have thought that must eventually run out. There can't be that many cash buyers. Thank you. Yeah. Our home builders are confident, as we saw in some previous data, and they're raising prices once again. So it's not like they are seeing you know, the crash coming and deciding to get the stock off their books by uh, cutting prices and, and pushing stuff out. Um, they, they appear to think that uh, the good times remain. Uh, building material costs are falling, which must be great for um, their profitability. If I was a home build, a house builder, I think I would just be trying to you know, um, complete and reduce my, my books and just hunker down. But uh, mm. perhaps if builders are seeing this and they're getting enough people through the door, that they're, they're yeah. keeping going. But strange. So, yeah, builders are confident and they would like to start more houses if credit was available. So it's not a question of just getting mm. through the, the previous stock. It, it, yeah. It's slightly flabbergasting, isn't it? And I believe... House builders' stocks have been quite strong this year, haven't they? Yeah, mystifying strength. So in summary, US house prices are beginning to fall, depending on the, the data. We're talking 2 4% year on year. New home sales bounced in January, but sales of existing homes have continued to decline. Um, at current prices and mortgage rates, the median house is unaffordable for the median buyer. Therefore, people just sit pat. They've, they've got a nice cheap mortgage. Why would you move? Uh, mortgage activity is very low, suggesting fresh buyers are looking at prices and mortgage rates and thinking it, the sums don't add up. Uh, house prices are very high relative to rents. You would expect that to, to normalise uh, in the near future. Yeah, I should also say that new home sales bounce not just in January, but I think in the whole of Q1. So. Sorry, that was a, that's a slip on my part. Now, if anyone n understands what is going on in the US construction market and why home sales have been so strong when affordability is so terrible, please get in touch because we would like to know. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Stuart. On to other charts. And Brexit happened in part because of concerns over excess immigration from the EU. Well, 
immigration into the UK is now much higher. And this is a breakdown. In part, it's driven by refugees from Ukraine and Hong Kong. But really, that's not that much. These are the blue bars. It's um, student visas and an increase in work visas. Now, taking a look at China. Now, there are lots of indications the Chinese economy is not doing as well as we had anticipated. In particular, the construction sector is not doing well. And we've talked about this literally for years. And if you look at the uh, floor place, if you look at floor space started, it's not great. Floor space sold, even worse. So fixed asset in investment is falling again well it makes total sense doesn't it I mean, it does the, yeah the, the prices that, that on residential at least and um, you know some of the, the yields that the things were being sold on had to to, to my mind were, were just simply crazy bubble levels but um yeah oh house That's prices only go up type logic well we've said for years and years it's unsustainable and perhaps finally we've reached the point where it is Yep, can't pump more air into the broken balloon. Yeah, now one thing that China is doing really well at is car exports. So this is a really astonishing chart, and this is monthly. Wow. So we've gone from China exporting 50,000 cars a month two years ago to the best part of 450,000 cars a month now. And in North London, I have noticed a lot of MGs around, which you remember the Chinese bought the MG brand. And how have they done that? Well, it would seem they've done it at the expense of Japan and Germany. And you've seen Germany's gone into recession. Well, that is deflation in action. Cheap Chinese cars. OK, and on to good news. And this is this today. So the BBC are reporting that AI has helped find a new antibiotic that is capable of killing superbugs. And we've known for years that antibiotic resistance was growing, leading to more deaths from septicemia in hospitals where people catch these um, antibiotic resistant superbugs. Well, there's hope now. So AI helped to narrow down thousands of potential antibiotic candidates to a handful that could then be tested in the lab, and they've found one that appears to work. So that is great news for everyone, a new antibiotic. And on to our checklists, Stuart. Okay, looking at equity markets, uh, the all share had a, a weak week, down 2.4%, as um, did the stocks Europe 600, also down the same amount. Uh, S&P 500 down 1.3. NASDAQ was the, the standout performer being flat. Uh, obviously, a lot of AI enthusiasm at, at the moment. Uh, Hang Seng was down 3.5%. Uh, Topics was not, 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 too, not too affected, down by 0.7%. Quite weak for Bitcoin, down just 2.4%. Um, the pound, to me, has been amazingly resilient, given all the dire UK news. It was off 0.7% for uh, the week, but is still up 1.8% um, uh, against the dollar over the year. Uh, Euro down about 0.6% again against the dollar. Uh, hence, the dollar index was up by about 0.8%. Uh, the VIX um, has finally broken out of its... Um, very weak trading levels, bounced up to 19.3 from 16. So an increase of about 20% uh, on the week. But still quite a low number, if truth be told. I was flabbergasted it got down to 15, 16. But um, yeah. I think we've had experience in the past of trying to buy an ETF that uh, mimics the VIX. And it's, uh, it's yeah. too painful. It's too clever by half. There's too many yeah. big roll costs. So something to avoid, even if you, you pat yourself on the back that you would have been right. 
Uh, the NASDAQ is up 33% from its lows. It has been a phenomenal year. We thought that we, in a sense, called this, didn't we, that, um, that mm. tech was over, the crazy valuations. We were going to have a repeat of the air coming out of the, uh, out of the bubble. But you know, although that was true the back end of last year, um, it's completely reversed, hasn't it, for the past six yep. months? It's up very strongly. Uh, peak rates normally actually coincide with the peak of economic activity and the peak in equity markets. Slightly dubious of these charts. Um, the peak in rates is being used to explain many, many different things, different times. Mm. But uh, yeah, but here's here's one argument that we should be, um, in a sense, you know, waiting uh, and and still investing until rates actually peak. Yeah, but also that. Cutting interest rates, everyone thinks that would be good for the stock market. Well, generally it ain't because, you know, the central banks cut interest rates because the economy is doing badly and it needs stimulating. Uh, tech stocks have been have hit new highs compared to the S and P uh, five hundred. We all thought that tech stocks were supposed to be influenced by long term interest rates. I mean, that was the argument mm. in the back end of last year. Long term cash flows being discounted at a higher interest rate. Therefore, all the Nasdaqi stuff should be off, which was true for a few months, and then it wasn't true. Yeah. No, I've got that absolutely, totally wrong. I mean, logically, that's true. In the markets, it ain't. It's weird. Yeah, it's uh, quite phenomenal, isn't it? I have almost no exposure to these these mega cap um, uh, mm. stocks, and I, I've therefore you know, been way behind uh, the indices yeah uh yes well this is an example of of the decoupling uh looking at um uh i think that tlt is a us uh, etf of long term bonds yeah uh, qqq is a, an etf of the nasdaq they were moving in lockstep uh that has all broken out uh, broken apart uh, this this year in particular yeah. uh, since the beginning of march Obviously, there's a big AI story going on here, which uh, yeah, I think we can all see that, that that's going to have a, a real economic impact. Um, who the ultimate winners are, obviously, very tricky to, to say. But for the moment, it seems to be Microsoft, NVIDIA, and possibly Google. Uh, speculative, speculative positioning is very short. Is that you and me, Keith? <laughs> no, I never go short, mate. But I just, you know, <laughs> psychologically, I'm short. So will the bears get squeezed? If so, that's another you know force driving uh, yeah. the market up. So here's uh, Keith and I complaining about this bear market rally, uh, but here's some data showing that, yeah, it's, it's fairly long in the tooth, but not there have been much longer ones, up mm. to 120 days. Uh, and we're at, what, about 70, 80 at the moment? Yeah. Um, S&P profits have held up astonishingly well, though we did point out earlier that the national accounts suggest they've been falling. So there could be, um, you know, large cap versus small cap issues. There could yes. also be uh, the issue of accounting manipulation and presentation. Um, yeah. I suspect the market is more susceptible to than the tax authorities. And if that's the basis for the national accounts data, perhaps that's a, a bit more reflective of, of real profit. Uh, small caps have massively underperformed uh, in the U.S., well, frankly, everything has underperformed um, yeah. but the mega cap. But uh, that's an interesting um, chunky decline to, to me. That that prompts me to want to begin to look at some absolute valuation measures on uh, uh, US uh, small cap to see whether uh, they've just returned to normal or whether they're, they're beginning to look cheap. I'm, I'm going to look into that. Okay. Interesting. Right. So as we keep uh, saying, that there, there's a very clear cluster within the market that's doing well. Uh, we can call them the fangs, we can call them whatever, but we, we all know the, the, these big names that uh, are driving everything. And it, the rest of the market has gone, frankly, nowhere. Mm. Um, in terms of looking at the earnings estimates, they have improved for, for the top 10 uh, mega cap stocks, but not for everyone else. Everyone else has fallen away quite sharply in the way that we've been expecting. Mm. Um, so you know, we've got to take it on the chin. It's not just uh, um, an AI bubble story. There are mm. improved earnings forecasts. 
Uh, what year of year changes in the S&P 500 and in the leading economic indicator are pretty good historically. However, the market is bouncing while the leading indicator is falling. Um, this is the fundamental reason we'd be cautious both on the economy and the market, but the market is doing what the market is doing. Yeah, but I think this you know, is uh, explained by the earlier charts where essentially the great mass of uh, stocks aren't doing that great, but there are these, these massive top 10 that are dis defying uh, the economy. So surely rising bond yields would be rising discount rates, which would lead to falling equities, but apparently not. Here we go. This yeah. is a chart of um, equities divided by bonds and um, up, up and away. Sentiment traders' bear market probability uh, model is at a record high. Do you know the composition of this at all? No, it's... not at all. But, you know, it's interesting nonetheless. It seems to have a reasonable track record. You know? Yeah, the bear market probability, very high. And uh, we keep talking about the, these mega companies and traditionally uh, a market rally, which is led in a very narrow way, is a very dodgy place to be. So um, mm. be careful. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Stuart. On to commodities and energy commodities, and it was generally a poor week. Brent and WTI, the oil futures, both fell heavily today. We will get into that. What's really good news is that European natural gas prices continued to fall and fell heavily with this week. They're down 67% year to date. U.S. natural gas futures also had a poor week, down 50% year to date. Coal was flat, but down 60% year to date. Uranium, flat. Numbers specific to the oil market. Well, we've had a couple of weeks of builds, and that unwound spectacularly this week, where we had a massive draw of 12 million barrels. Now, you'd think that would be bullish for the oil price. Oil prices drifted off, as you saw the uh, crude production ticked up by 100,000 barrels back to its recent highs of 12.3 million barrels a day in the US. The Baker Hughes rig count is falling sharply, down another 11 this week. So this is crude. Now, today, WTI fell by almost 4% after the Russian deputy prime minister ruled out additional production cuts by OPEC+. Plus. And the fall in crude prices can be attributed to the surprise rise in Russian oil production over the past year. And the red line is Russian oil production. And note, it's an inverted chart. So it has risen back towards its pre-invasion highs. And the oil price has fallen as it's increased production. These are European natural gas futures. That has fallen a long way back towards its pre-pandemic norms, about 20. Well, UK... One quick question on, on, on this, on um, natural gas uh, prices. Mm -hmm. Presumably this will mean, as we've seen with the energy price cap, uh, lower energy prices for, for uh, consumers. Mm -hmm. So have you... Uh, change your electricity supply are, are are there suppliers now who don't bang up against the cap who are offering a, a lower price is it worth us having a look um to, to switch well that's a very good question Stuart. honestly i haven't looked because i was but, on bulb who have been taken you know where obviously went bust <laughs> and have been taken over by octopus and i think everyone is on the price cap i it's interesting whether anyone is offering below the price cap have a look yeah u.s natural gas futures failing to recover at their recent lows coal following natural gas down as you'd expect uranium actually showing some resilience at recent highs industrial commodities stuart pretty weak numbers across the board here aluminium down two and a half percent for the week uh, cobalt, very poor, minus about 14% are now minus 42% year to date. Copper, uh, this is a, in a sense a more meaningful uh, commodity, uh, minus 3.8% on the week. 
6% for the year, very weak. Uh, iron ore off 10% for the week. Neodymium oxide bouncing a little, up 3.5%. Nickel off another 1.5%, so down almost a third for the year. Tin off 3.4%. Um, Pervanadium flat, zinc off minus 7%. So uh, lots of evidence of uh, the impact on commodity prices from the weakness in manufacturing and industrial activity. So the chart for aluminium, very sick. Cobalt, uh, a step change down there. Copper, oh, that looks terrible, doesn't it? Mm. Dr. Copper diagnosing a sick economy. Copper is in super contango. Right. So this is the cash versus three month uh, price, um, about $60 uh, difference. Mm. Um, so this, uh, I always get my contangos and backward back, back, backwardations mixed up. So this is telling us that uh, cash price is lower than three yes. months price. So basically there's a glut. It's saying that right now, nobody wants copper, but they're thinking in three months time, prices will be higher. Uh, chromium, uh, very weak. Uh, yeah, another little step change down there. Iron ore, after a bit of a bounce, has, has come off again. Uh, lithium showing a little bit of life, but I think the bigger picture here is the, the massive crash from November last year. Neodymium, uh, perhaps forming a bit of a bottom. We need Richard to interpret the chart. Nickel, ugh. That looks miserable, doesn't it? Um, mm. Trying to trying to get some life earlier um, a couple of months ago and having fallen off. Tin, uh, again, also limp. Ferrovanadium, um, should, no sign of life. Zinc, oh God, that's sort of the worst of the lot, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, moving on to precious metals. Uh, gold, um, a weak week, minus 1.2% there failing to keep above the $2,000 an ounce mark. Silver, even worse, down 4% for the week. Uh, platinum, 3.5%. Rhodium, 1.4%. Palladium, minus 4.7%. So even the precious metals aren't loved for their protection from uh, the US debt ceiling and debt issue crises. Um, very weak weeks. Yeah. As you would expect, when interest rates are rising, cost of carry has gone up. So here's gold having failed to uh, convince uh, on, on the breakout down to uh, $1,940 an ounce. Silver, uh, same, sort of same sort of depressing pattern. Uh, and platinum too. Rhodium, oh, that looks awful. Very att attempted small bounce, which is completely petered out and reversed. Uh, palladium, perhaps a short-term trading bottom, but don't take my word for it. Okay, thanks, Stuart. And on to rates. And it was another absolutely shocking week in um, UK. So the one year rose by an absolutely enormous 50 basis points. And there were rises all across the curve. And that was not reflected elsewhere. So Greek 10 years actually fell by 15 basis points. Italian and Spanish were flat. So the market is saying it's lost confidence in the UK, that it, the market does not think the UK has got inflation under control and they are demanding higher yields to buy UK debt. Now, this is the UK bond yield curve. And the blue line is now, the green line is three months ago, and the yellow line is a year ago, I believe, from memory. Now, because of the rise in rates this week, Nationwide have announced today that they will be raising their mortgage rates by as much as 45 basis points from Friday, and other mortgage lenders are expected to follow suit. So... The falls in bond prices, the rise in UK yields have economic consequences. There will be 
tightening of monetary policy without the Bank of England. So the Bank of England has lost control of the yield curve. Now, what I find really interesting about the yield curve in the UK is how flat it is. So the market is essentially pricing in very high interest rates for the next 50 years. So they don't believe that the Bank of England will get inflation back to 2%. Now, turning to the US, you'll see that the economic surprise index from Goldman Sachs has been fading while the 10-year yields have been rising. That doesn't make sense. Maybe it's the debt ceiling that investors are losing confidence in um, US debt. And speculators have a huge net short in the US two-year, although commentary is this is part of a relative value trade and not a na naked short. But gilt yields, I mean, frankly, I've got this terribly wrong. The Bank of England has absolutely failed to get inflation under control and yields are now back to where they were under the short-lived trust government, which we all thought was the apogee of incompetence. Well, Bank of England has not done its job. So this is the UK one year, and just see how this has shifted up in the past year. Enormous rises. In a two year, you know, oh, this, look at that. Goodness. Look at that. That is the trust government. And it's right back up there. Ten year. I Frankly, I didn't believe that the UK economy could live with these numbers, given their very high debt levels. 30 year, you know, I am getting absolutely crucified by this. I've got this completely wrong. These are really big numbers. I didn't think that the UK could live with bond yields this high. US 10-year, mystifyingly, is also spiking when, frankly, when I look at the US inflation data, it seems it's coming down quite quickly. And it's particularly puzzling when you look at US five-year, five-year forwards, which are showing no concerns about US future inflation. So why is the 10-year rising so much? This is German 10-year, Italian, Greek. Greek's doing quite well. So I have gone to hold on my bonds because, frankly, in the UK, it could go anywhere. The market, the Bank of England has lost the confidence of the bond market. The um, 30 year has now gone to like four and a half. Is there anything to stop it going to five? No. I just, they've, you just have to wait and see. I think bonds in the UK only become a buy when um, the Bank of England regains the confidence of the market, and that could be anywhere. Stuart, your thoughts? Well, well I haven't changed my opinions. I, I, I know I've been wrong. Um, you know, look, look at me there. Sell the US, buy the world ex-US. And yeah. it, it's the US which is continuing onwards and upwards. I, I, I can't see it. I can't buy things like NVIDIA. Um, so I'm, I'm persisting with this, but feeling, feeling the pain. Yeah. Including comments. Okay. Well, it's been a terrible week in the UK for inflation. So UK inflation is persistent. The bank of England has lost control of the yield curve and the confidence of bond markets. It's been a terrible week for UK bonds. And as you will see in due course, a terrible week for me. UK and EU PMIs showed both services and manufacturing weakening in April, and US PMIs showed services strengthening in April, but manufacturing weakening further. The US debt ceiling is approaching. The X date is next Friday, and a deal is not yet done. Stuart, how have you been doing? Uh, well, not uh, not so good, uh, Keith. I'm perhaps not as painful as you, but I'm down 1.2% uh, for the year. This is despite uh, equity markets in general being uh, being strong, not just at the Nasdaq but uh, across the board. 
I've got my usual drip, drip, drip of, of income. However, I'm, I'm totally missing out in the protect led um, equity markets. And I've sort of been hurt by my bond proxies. And I'm earning you know, five, six, seven percent on from infrastructure and lending uh, investment trusts, but uh, I'm losing it again on the capital value as, as they, they weaken uh, as bond yields rise. So to, to highlight a couple of things that I, I have been up to, um, I've been buying a couple of small positions in, uh, in the Japanese equity market where mm. I'm trying to make a bet on absolute value and uh, restructuring opportunities. Now, I'm very conscious that we've heard the dawn of the Japanese um, uh, taking on of shareholder value time and again. So these are not big positions, but there are, I think there is some evidence of um, constructive activists uh, getting uh, changes to Japanese corporate management. And just as importantly, the Japanese government and the stock exchange are putting pressure on companies with low price to book and low return on equity to improve their performance. And often what that means is, yes, trying to improve the, the profitability, but it just as much means um, uh, paying attention to the, the capital structure, buying back shares, reducing uh, book value. So I've invested in two uh, investment trusts, AJOT and NAVF, both of which invest in small Japanese stocks um, looking for restructuring opportunities. Mm. They performed reasonably, uh, historically, not great, but, but reasonably. Um, part of that issue, the issue for them, is the, the yen has been weak. So decent local currency performance has been uh, lost to, to uh, the weak yen. Uh, picking up on one of the themes in my previous talks, uh, REITs, I've been having a look over my REITs and um, frankly taking my medicine in a couple of them. Now, I've had um, some exposure to a couple of European logistics REITs. So this is not offices where we've got the work from home issue. Um, this is warehouses. So I bought them um, based on the fact that this was a growing sector. Europe is behind the UK, UK is behind the US. We know everything that's happening with online uh, shopping and big warehouses that are necessary for that. So it was a growing sector. And the crucial thing to me was that the, the rents were linked contractually to CPI, without often without any caps on those, those links. And they had a very low cost of debt. So in my mind, revenues were going to be steadily advancing with the CPI link, and debt was going to be fantastic. There it was, you know, locked in at very low um, European interest rates. Well, what I got wrong was that I can't believe just how much of the rents were frittered away in the operating costs of, of these two companies. Up to 30% of the revenue uh, was lost to uh, operating expenses. So typically one might have been buying a, a European warehouse on a 4% net investment yield, which not mm. great, but, but okay when interest rates were negative or zero in, in Europe but much less okay when 30% of the rents uh, have gone in operating costs. So that was painful. And the thing which has tripped, uh, pushed me over the edge is having a finer tooth comb look through the uh, debt situation of, of these trusts. So for instance, Tritax Eurobox had a fantastically cheap loan. They borrowed uh, 500 million euros at under 1%. The trouble is we're now getting close to the maturity of that debt. Mm. And, you know, you're going to go from 1% to 4%, 4.5% maybe. And uh, on my calculations, that means all of the rental growth that they're going to get between, uh, between now and 2025 is going to be used up in, in higher interest payments. Mm. So I'm not going to get the, that, that jaws effect of um, CPI-linked uh, revenues up and, and debt um, remaining debt costs remaining low. So I don't really see the prospect for, for, for dividend growth and, and earnings growth. So I, I've, I've taken my medicine. I've sold both of these um, at a bit of a loss. Uh, the capital loss was about 20, 
ameliorated to some extent by a few years dividends but, but basically would i buy them today no so should i have been holding them no i've, I've tried to sort of take my loss and uh, hence i've sold those two i think that there's a bigger lesson here as well in that i, I think perhaps i'm susceptible to buying an interesting concept and, mm -hmm. and i should wait for more actual track record in particular experiencing what those expense ratios were uh, for mm -hmm. these REITs. So don't get suckered in by like a great story, basically, and wait a while to, to, to see uh, how the actual operational performance uh, um, pans out. Wise words. So uh, a couple of charts. We talked about the VIX. I was having a look over my charts the other day and, and saw that this incredibly low level of the VIX. Um, actually, it's bounced over the past week, as we've seen, but I was flabbergasted that it was around 16 given all the macroeconomic uh, risks out there alongside the debt ceiling risks. Yeah. Other uh, things that make you go, hmm, well, this is the uh, high yield option adjusted spread. Again, just not as much as you would think. Um, uh, during the mm -hmm. pandemic, that's um, ballooned out to 11%. Uh, more usually a 6% spread would indicate a nice time to buy, but you know we're not even at 5% despite the economic outlook. Um, avoid uh, junk debt. Um, just a quick reminder about what's happening to the federal debt. Um, it's coming down in a sense relative to GDP, just as a, an inflation artifact, GDP growing nominally. But this is likely to get much worse, much quicker, as US debt is much more short term than UK debt. So we'll get refinanced at uh, more like 4%. And we know that will be on top of the actual annual uh, deficits, which, as Keith highlighted, look like they might even be two two trillion dollars this year. Mm. Uh, this is the Case Shiller U.S. House House Price Index, which we can see has come off uh, the top, but hasn't actually fallen that far. We'll see if that other data we saw this week bears out, and an actual price falls continue to make this index uh, weaker over the subsequent months. Never bet against the US consumer. One of the things that I was told uh, when I started working in financial markets, and, and look at the consistency of that yeah. line. This is in real US dollars. Obviously, it takes a hit during COVID, but it comes back to that, that trend line and is onwards and upwards. Mm. Now, whether it's Amazing. been funded by uh, wages or debt, separate issue, but the US consumers are spending. Um, here are some leading economic indicators. We've looked at this particularly for the states uh, where the, the LEIs are quite weak, and that's confirmed in the OECD a version of this data. We can see the green line. But interestingly, outside of, of the states, there's a bit of a pickup, even in the mm. UK, where we've seen over the past three or four months, there's some uh, real pickup in the leading uh, economic indicators for Asia, Europe, and the UK. Yeah. How about you, Keith? You've referred to Trouble times. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing really, really badly because I've got it completely wrong. So, you know, regular viewers will know I've been banging on about this, but the um, I've taken a big position in um, long dated guilt on the expectations that uh, rising interest rates would rapidly slow the economy and um, bring inflation under control. Hasn't happened. It's been the opposite. Actually, Bank of England's lost control of interest rates. And I've got absolutely stuffed. But so this week, I added to it slightly by selling short dated, buying the 2044. Now, the way I see it is if I buy the 2044, I get inflation plus 1% for the next 22 years. And given my current age that's probably the age at which i will be sorting starting to roll over so you know at that point if i can get inflation plus one percent to then i don't have any worries in the world frankly if inflation picks up i'm protected if inflation collapses real yields should fall and i should make money on the trade so I don't really care what happens to the um, mark to market if I can hold them to maturity. Because can you, can, can you be that patient? Well, 
That's a good question. Depends where that obviously depends whether a better opportunity comes along. Yeah. Yeah. If a better opportunity comes along, you take losses and you switch into it. But you know, if inflation so, so this week we had RPI of 1.5% for April. So if you hold this for in three months' time, so that's April, May, June, July. So if you hold it for the month of July, you're going to get 1.5%. You know, frankly, I'll take that. Anyway, you know, I've been way overconfident. And this is very wise words from uh, Mark Train. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you just know for sure, which just ain't so. And in this case, I was thinking, as you regular viewers will know, I thought stagflation is absolutely impossible because the Bank of England would raise rates to get inflation back to down to 2%, killing the economy. So, but the Bank of England hasn't raised rates hard enough. And so right now we've got stagflation because the Bank of England's been weak. Now, I take a lot of risk. <laughs> Sometimes it goes spectacularly wrong, but you know, Medium term, I've done all right. But I like this. This will be me over the next <laughs> few weeks. So anyway, to reiterate, inflation's too high. You can take advantage of that by buying the one-year index-linked gilt that matures in March this next year. Inflation's too high. RPI remains above 10 percent if you it stays above 10 percent then if you hold tr24 to maturity you will make inflation tax-free much much better than anything you can get in the bank now i have bought t44 which will give you inflation plus one percent for the next 21 years you know if you're a higher rate taxpayer that's really good now if the price falls further, that means you have marked market losses and you could have bought it at an even better yield. But, you know, I've still got some ammo and frankly, I intend to switch more into that if and when uh, prices go against me. And finally, the price of the instrument that's causing me all the pain. And reminder, a month ago, I was flat. You know, inflation expectations can change really quickly. This thing has fallen 30% in six weeks. And that has been painful and stressful for yours truly. But it can reverse that remarkably quickly if um, the Bank of England gets inflation under control. Now, are they going to do that? Are they going to be, you know, pissy weak? I think you'd best you'd bet on them being pissy weak and letting inflation run hot. So I am expecting that um, inflation, I'm expecting to have uh, further losses in the coming weeks. But, you know, this can't go to zero because then UK rates go to infinity. So as long as I hold this for the next 45 years, I will get <laughs> inflation plus 1%. And so, you know, anyway. I'm ordering oh. the humble pie. <laughs> I shall have a serving as well. I'm um, <laughs> hardly making out like a bandit this year. Yeah, well, you know, not great, but you have to laugh. And, you know, it's painful, but you live and breathe the markets, you do the work, and then it blows up in your face. But anyway. Um, thank you all for watching through to the end. And thank you for Stuart Owen for recording on this Thursday night. And please, can you press like and subscribe to the channel? And it's goodbye from Stuart. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned.
Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.